Good morning. It is Tuesday, August 31st. Welcome into the morning medical update. Coming up today, can your pets get COVID? Can they get a COVID test? We are talking more about how to keep your family safe during the surge in COVID cases, including your beloved pets. So we're going to hear from two K-State University mm. virology and wildlife specialists to find out more about that. But first, Doc Hawk joins us with the COVID yeah. count. Good morning to you. What are the numbers this morning? Hi. Hi. Well, I was a little bit happier yesterday because I thought our cases maybe were plateauing or starting to trend down. Uh, we, I think we were in the low 50s. Today we have 60 active infections with 22 in the ICU, 14 on the ventilator, and 47 in that recovery period. And we should note that we have nine of our 60 patients that are fully vaccinated. So that is 15%. Again, we've seen around the nation that the majority, 95% or more of those people uh, who are in the hospital are unvaccinated. Our numbers tend to be uh, a little bit lower for the unvaccinated population compared even to some of our colleagues around the city. But I think that's because of the patient mix that we're getting the selection bias and some of those patients that maybe are transferred in, as well as our large population of solid organ transplant, cancer uh, patients, and other people who are immunosuppressed. All right, it's just you and me today. Are you good with that? I'm good. Okay. And we should say also that Hayes still has 12 patients, but 11 of those are active, one in the recovery period. Uh, they had 12 full active yesterday, so they're still kind of holding steady. Okay, thanks for that update. Again, you and me, Dr. Seitz will be back tomorrow, but we've got a couple of really good, interesting guests today, so stay Absolutely. tuned for that. Um, okay, so we need your help with something. Our local blood shortage is low. We are, we've been talking about this, so take a look at this and see if you can give back. Right now, there is a two to three day supply that's considered low it should be about a seven day supply this is incredibly concerning right now with emergency rooms so remember donating blood it's safe we've been talking about this since the beginning of the pandemic it only takes about an hour the community blood center is taking extra precautions to prevent the spread of covid so no worries to schedule an appointment or learn more about hosting a blood drive you can call the number right there on your screen or you can visit savealifenow.org and i would say yeah we know there's a lot of construction on Maine. Hopefully it will not deter other people from calling a community blood center and going down, down there to give because it is vitally important now, especially as we're coming into a holiday weekend. We know we tend to see more trauma or things of that nature on holiday weekends as well. So please go donate. Very good point. Thanks, Doc Hawk. Okay, so we're going to get to our reporter questions. Anyone on the line today? Hi, this is Jody Pertino with KCUR. Hey, Jody. Hey, so a group of Northland parents are suing several local school districts, Kansas City and North Kansas City over their mask mandates and quarantine policies. And in there, the lawsuit has several claims like COVID is not as severe in children, children don't spread the virus as much as adults, and that masks are not effective and can actually harm children. What is mm -hmm. your reaction and you know, what is the science behind these claims? Yeah, I mean, I think we start and we just start and end with the medicine and the science. And those statements that you made are completely untrue. The, again, the consistent evidence would suggest and would support the exact opposite of those things. We had a pediatrician on, Dr. Angela Myers, yesterday. We have seen and we do know that COVID affects children. And as you have more children infected, you will have more children affected. They have, uh, they still have a risk, although low, of going to the hospital, but they also have that risk of that multi-system inflammatory disorder. They have the risk of long COVID. And so we do know that COVID-19 does affect and infect children and can cause uh, short-term and long-term effects as well. So the best thing to do, again, if, if you have a child that's 12 or over, please go get them vaccinated. The other issue with the mass is we know that's uh, completely false as well. So those, those statements are not based on fact or the majority of the consistent science. Other questions on the line today? Hi guys, it's Taylor at 41, good morning. Hey Taylor, Hi. good morning. Uh, one thing that I'm, I'm, we may have talked about in the back to school, but something that occurred to me because I've talked about that I have kids that go to school. What can you remind us on, since most everyone's requiring masks, especially for the young students right now, best practices on those those masks? If they're if they're wearing cloths, is it bad to be wearing the same ones every day? Should I be washing them on a regular basis, or you know, if I if I have, do I need to have a mask for every day of the week? What's the best practices for my kids going to school with uh, with masks? 
Yeah, you know, I think um, I think it'd be okay to wear it a couple days in a row. Our guidance has been maybe you want to have, if they're cloth masks, just as you say, maybe you want to have three so that you can have the student wearing one. You can have one uh, in, in supply and then you can be washing one as well. So you can rotate that as well. Uh, but wearing a mask uh, one or two days, two days in a row is not going to cause harm. We saw that how many people were wearing masks over this past year. Who do we not see? And we did not see people with new or unusual pneumonias or bacterial infections because they're breathing in and using those masks all the time. So I think the best guidance is to continue to have two or three masks so that you can be washing one and using one at the same time. But if you go uh, two days or so uh, while using the same mask, it's not going to cause harm to that child. And the most important thing about the masking is, again, the fit. We, we know people are concerned about double masking and things of that nature, but even the spirit of that guidance is that you want a mask that fits well so it blocks um, the areas around the outside of the mask so you're not inhaling um, uh, viral particles or uh, droplets from the external environment due to that. My uh, five-year-old's kindergarten teacher has me pack three to four clean masks every single wow. day. Okay. They change them out. I thought, wow, you could teach 25-year-olds and get them to swap out their yeah. masks, you know, three or four times a day when they come in, if they get sweaty, if they get wet. So, yes, I've been put on strict orders to make sure they have three to four yeah. clean ones every day. So, hey, I think you that's know. smart advice by the school. Yeah. Other questions? Taylor, do you have any follow-ups? No, thank you. All right. All right. We are good with reporter questions. We're going to get to your community questions here in just a few minutes. So start sending those in. I am looking those over right now. But I want to bring in our guests today. These two guys joining us virtually, Dr. Stephen Higgs. He is the Associate Vice President for Research and Director of the Biosecurity Research Institute. Very long title, very important guy. Along with Dr. Jurgen Richt. He is the Director of the Center of Excellence for Emerging and Zoonotic Animal Diseases. Did I get that right? Everybody, I've got everybody's name mm -hmm. right and titles right. How are you guys doing this morning? We're, we're good, Jessica. Uh, it's a real privilege to be uh, invited and be able to uh, chat with you today. Thank you for the invitation. Well, gosh, we are we are really glad to have you both. Um, and we get a lot of questions that I know both of you can answer for us today. Um, but Dr. Higgs, I'm just gonna start off with you and just tell us a little bit about this lab in which you work and you are researching COVID and its effects. Um, just start us off and tell us all about what's going on inside that lab. All right, thank you, Jessica. So this is a one of a kind facility anywhere in the world here at uh, Kansas State University in, in Manhattan. It is a high containment facility, um, which enables safe and secure research on a, a whole variety of, of pathogens, uh, including SARS-CoV-2. Uh, I think we've worked with over 20 pathogens in the last two years alone. We've been uh, operating with a lot of different things since 2009. Um, the reason it's unique is that it, it enables us to do research on foodborne pathogens, on pathogens that affect plants, such as wheat, uh, pathogens that affect livestock and, and poultry, and then also zoonotic pathogens uh, like SARS, Kobe 2 that infects both animals and people. Um, I, I said the word high containment. So these types of facilities are rated on, uh, in simple terms, how dangerous the pathogens are with which we work. So we operate um, at what we call biosafety level three and biosafety level three agriculture. Uh, BSL three is one level down from, from Ebola. Uh, types of facilities, which I've got biosafety level four. So uh, we're very proud of the facility and uh, people like Jürgen uh, are doing phenomenal mm -hmm. research here and then we do a lot of education and training as well. Well, thank you for sharing that. I want you to jump in on some of these questions. And I, we're going to talk a little bit about ivermectin. It's a question and a word that we hear maybe too often here on the show. So I want to um, bring you both in on that. In fact, we talked about how our poison control center has seen an increase of calls around people using ivermectin, which is intended for animals to treat and prevent COVID. Um, uh, Dr. Rick, I'm going to ask you about that. But uh, Dr. Higgs, just what do you make of that trend? 
Um, well, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not medically qualified. I'm, I'm, unlike Dr. Rick, I'm not a veterinarian, and I know that ivermectin is used um, basically to eliminate uh, intestinal parasites, I believe, worms from uh, from livestock. Um, you know, there is cross use of different drugs uh, for for different treatments, but I'm not the expert on on this particular area, and uh, you know, anything that people are doing to prevent COVID infection should be backed up by sound data and, and approvals. But I'll, I'll, I'll pass to Jürgen. He's the veterinarian and expert on, on this type of thing. All right. So, Dr. Rick, let's bring you in. You are the expert. What do you make of this trend, first of all? And then I just then I want to jump into ivermectin in general. But what do you think, what do you make of this word being thrown around and people using this for, to fight COVID? So to can you repeat your question, the trend of using ivermectin? Just, yeah, or? just this trend that people are on, this trend of using ivermectin to treat and prevent COVID, something that is used primarily on animals and people um, using ivermectin. Talk to us about that Thanks. and just what do you make of it? And then just jump into what ivermectin does. Yeah, so I start with what ivermectin does. It's a a drug which is used for treating endo and ecto parasites and it's used in both in the animal kingdom as well as in, in human medicine for this purpose so it's an anti anti-parasitic drug it's very effective um it has been shown in vitro studies that is it also has an effect against SARS-CoV-2 in vitro means in cell culture and the um, in cell culture, its efficacy, we, we call it IC50 inhibitory concentration, is in the micromolar range, which is not very good. It has efficacy in vitro, but it's not very, uh, uh, very good in its efficacy. So that's number one. Number two, in animal studies, in animal studies, which use SARS-CoV-2 for um, uh, 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 models, it has not been shown to be efficacious or highly therapeutic for SARS-CoV-2. And in human uh, clinical trials, the uh, jury is still out. Some studies say it's not working well. Other studies say it's maybe working. So the jury is still out whether it works in humans against SARS-CoV-2. We know it works in cell culture, but we don't know that whether it works in humans. So using a drug which, uh, and, and buying a drug which is formulated for horses or cattle or other animals and using it as a human is not a very smart thing to do. Dr. Hawkinson, that's what you say every day. Yeah, and I think we should note that a lot of drugs for a lot of things in cell culture, in those early stages of research and development, look to have activity. But it's one thing to do it in a lab, and it's one thing to give it to a human. Uh, so I think there are a lot of places in that continuum that will that can then show and that's when a lot of the drugs do slip up and eventually do not come to market so i think that is very important to note and uh, the important thing to note too that we heard also is in the context of these trials that are going on and there are two large trials going on uh, around the world and in the united states looking at this and i think that is uh uh, wholly valuable in what we need to do. But right now, the bulk of the consistent evidence uh, would not favor the use of ivermectin. And we have seen this as the FDA uh, warns against its use. The Infectious Disease Society of America does not recommend its use. World Health Organization does not recommend its use as well. So, um, and it's only unless it is in that clinical trial. And that is what we need. We need uh, further uh, good best evidence to really kind of put this question uh, to rest. Is it beneficial or is it not beneficial? Well, I think it's settled then. All right, so I want to talk about COVID and I animals. I would like to add one Please. point. I test, my, my team tests a lot of these repurposed drugs in animal models of COVID-19. And some of these drugs have 10 to 100 times higher efficacy in cell culture against SARS-CoV-2 
but they fail mm. in animal models of COVID-19 to inhibit virus replication or to ameliorate the, uh, ameliorate the disease. So something as uh, was mentioned before, a drug which works in vitro well doesn't mean it also works in a patient very well. Over. So Dr. Rick, tell me about uh, COVID in animals. There's a, um, a population of deer that had ant tested positive for antibodies of COVID. How would they be getting those? So COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 infection in animals have been reported uh, since the start of the pandemic. It started with pet companion animals. Um, early on, uh, it was recognized that cats and dogs living in households with COVID-19 patients also got infected. And uh, some of them even with clinical signs. Later on, we realized that uh, zoo animals, especially large cats and also primates like gorillas, etc., in zoos were infected by their uh, caretakers, infected caretakers. And all of these animals, we have studied, for example, the companion animals in experimental systems, uh, very carefully the cat, domestic cats, they were highly susceptible also to experimental infection. And not only do they get infected, they, they shed very efficiently SARS-CoV-2 and can infect their little mates, their non-infected little mates. So this was already uh, recognized very early on. Studies uh, by um, colleagues at USDA in Ames, Iowa, and by ourselves here at Kansas State University showed that white-tailed deer, mm -hmm. which are very, um, very frequent, that we, we have about 30 million of these white-tailed deer in the United States are highly susceptible to SARS-CoV-2 infection and also transmitted very efficiently to non-infected pen mates. And the people at USDA and Ames, they infected young animals, six months old, and we used two-year-old animals and both young and old were highly susceptible. So it was already established experimentally that white-tailed deer are highly susceptible to SARS, experimental SARS-CoV-2 infection. And then about a month ago, there was an, a report by uh, the uh, 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 facility or by investigators from Colorado, from USDA APHIS, and they reported that they found in about 40% of sera collected from white-tailed deer in various states, Michigan, Pennsylvania, New York, and Illinois, I believe, that 40% of these sera contain antibodies which specifically recognize SARS-CoV-2. So not only do we know now wild animals, are now apparently seropositive and carry the virus. And there is there another case of a mink. They found a mink about um, half a year ago in the state of Utah, a wild mink, which was also found to be positive for SARS-CoV-2. So there is now evidence that the virus, which transmitted very efficiently between humans, also can infect animals, and not only domestic animals, but also animals in the wild. Okay, so in just a moment, I want to talk about getting animals vaccinated. I want to talk about that in just a moment, but I first want to get to a few of our community questions that are coming in. Um, Dr. Hawkinson, Jennifer has a question for you. Would, what would you say to a doctor who is actively promoting ivermectin as an effective treatment for COVID-19 and claiming it as, as effective as the vaccine? Mm -hmm. She said this actually happened. She wants your perspective. Again, I think it's time for a new physician at this point in time. That would, again, that would not be consistent with the current bulk of the data. Uh, there is nothing to support that ivermectin has any effect, any beneficial effect, anywhere similar. 
to what we know the vaccines do. So I think that's kind of the, the short answer. You know, I have to keep asking you this because this question keeps coming up. So we know that know. Um, this viewer is not the only person who has questions and she must have heard this from someone else who heard it from another person. So we know that that's out there. So I think we probably need to say it every day until the question goes away. So Joyce wants to know, because we were talking about donating blood and just a reminder, the blood supply is low here in our area. Joyce wants to know if you donate blood, do you learn if you have antibodies against COVID? Do you know? You know, I think that is um specific to the place where you are donating at um, i thought community blood center was offering or giving uh antibody tests to those people that donate but i certainly could be off um, i don't know if the red cross is again i think it's specific to those places where you're donating Okay, Holly wants to know, back on the ivermectin topic, yeah. um, she said she created a large nurse community in KC, and we have nurses in our group mm -hmm. that say that local physicians are prescribing ivermectin to their patients. Mm -hmm. uh, do you all, I'm just gonna answer that, yeah. no. Um, but as a physician, do you know about, or have you heard mm -hmm. of these stories or know of any doctors that are doing this? Yeah, certainly, um, doctors are prescribing it again. Um, but it's not based on the most consistent evidence that would show that there is no benefit of ivermectin either in protection against COVID-19 or in treatment of COVID-19 at this point in time. Okay, Amber wants to know, how soon would you recommend being tested with a PCR test after an exposure, but you have no symptoms? Mm -hmm. Well, if you're vaccinated, the guidance would be testing three to five days after that exposure. If you're not having any symptoms, I would probably wait that longer period, about five days. If you do develop symptoms, I would go get tested at that point. Cindy wants to know, has Doc Hawk heard of the new C12 variant? Uh, yeah, very, very little bit. I think that's uh, the one that they're looking at in South Africa. Again, we are going to see variants come up uh, from now until whenever. Uh, because number one, we have the technology, we have readily available technology to do mass sequencing of a lot of different isolates at a lot of different times in a lot of different countries. So I think to identify these new variants is nothing uh, that is surprising to me. Now, what is the full clinical or global effect? We won't know that. We do know that SARS-CoV-2 is continuing to evolve, uh, you know, it looks a lot different than the original ancestral strain that we found in Wuhan originally compared to we are now, where we are now with Delta. But I think the important thing to remember is that everything we have identified, all the variants that we have identified, the current vaccines still provide very excellent activity against protecting against that whole spectrum of COVID-19, but mostly important for protecting against hospitalization severe disease and death. So I think we are going to see more variants arise and that should not be surprising to anybody, but we know that the way to continue to protect yourself and your community is to go get vaccinated. Dr. Rick, uh, Peggy wants to know, can you get COVID from your pet? You mentioned cats. So far, there is no reported case of a human infection from a companion animal. However, last year there were significant outbreaks in mink farms in Europe and also in the United States and Canada. Uh, mink is uh, a farm for the fur and these mink are highly susceptible to SARS-CoV-2 and they got infected by their, um, by their owners or workers and it really, uh, replicates and transmits very well within mink. And in the Netherlands and in Denmark, there were cases that these mink were transmitting a mutated, a different version of SARS-CoV-2 back to humans. And based on this evidence, all the mink farms which were affected or the, the whole region in Denmark was culled mm -hmm. because there was, an, there was this, uh, the, the, zoonotic event from mink to humans yeah you know i love that question a uh, great question and, and a really good answer i think we're right we we heard about all of those those mink that had to be culled uh i think it was in denmark because of that reason so i think it is important to understand that uh and especially the first part of his answer that we saw 
we know you can transmit it. Some of the animals may have some symptoms. Um, I think it's maybe canines or dogs that don't really get any symptoms. Maybe cats can, but right now, it's just as he said, we haven't seen a, any evidence that it, it goes back from those animals to the human population. Uh, so I think, but that is important to know. And I think there always could be further, uh, you know, backspill events back to the human population from those animals. That's always a, a viable um, mechanism as well. Emily wants to know for hunters, can they get COVID by eating a deer that is positive? Dr. Rick? Question for me? Yes, it is. <laughs> so, um, as we all know, SARS-CoV-2 is mainly a respiratory pathogen and it's not uh, doesn't have a viremic phase meaning it's not trans uh, it's not circulating in the blood uh, at least not in high amounts so if you have um if you obviously as a hunter you kill an animal which is uh, infected and you got that animal and you don't have uh, and you take out the plug the lungs etc where the virus resides there is a chance that you get infected. However, the the meat, um, the, the venison is most likely uh, clean and you don't have a high chance to get infected. Over. Uh, okay, a couple more questions for you, doctor, also. And I love it when our viewers are asking the questions that I already had ready to ask, because I know that these are some good ones right here. Okay, so Sue says, is it common that illnesses and diseases in humans can also be found in animals? Does this mean that we will eventually need to have our pets vaccinated for COVID? So that's a very good question, and it's a question for me, right? Yes, sir. Um, we, are, we are already vaccinating some animals, Sue animals, against and against SARS-CoV-2 infections. And the vaccine is a vaccine which was uh, developed by uh, Soetis. It's a, a veterinary pharmaceutical company. And we tested it actually here at Kansas State in a, in a cat model of COVID-19. And this vaccine is distributed throughout the United States in zoos to protect endangered animal species primates, large cats, etc. So this is already happening. However, there is no recommendation. The other, uh, th uh, the other event which is happening at Mink, that USDA is encouraging uh, vaccine uh, companies to produce uh, a vaccine for Mink. However, there is no recommendation so far and also no need to uh, vaccinate cats or dogs. Oh, Another I question. have a couple of questions, maybe. Um, Please jump in. So, uh, I mean, the, the comment about animals and people, about 60% of diseases which emerge are what we call zoonotic, which is uh, also in the name of, of Dr. Rick's center. Uh, so about 60% of new pathogens that arise, certainly new viruses, are kind of spillovers from, from wildlife, from, from animals. Uh, that's, a, that's commonly where they come from. I was, I was going to ask maybe Dr. Rick a couple of questions. Um, mm -hmm. So you, your studies have uh, proved that cats are susceptible, typically not symptomatic, and that they spread virus. I assume that cats which have been naturally infected have been infected from their owners. Um, if they're shedding virus, there's a potential for them to infect their owners. But is it a situation where since those owners were infected and the source of the cat infection in the first place. That's why we're not seeing pet to owner transmission. Um, so this is get, get going back to the question, can cats or pets who are infected with COVID-19 infect their owners? And we have seen that with Mick. And obviously the virus which replicates in cats uh, is very similar to the human virus. So if there is a chance, this virus might be able to also infect naive owners or household members. So whenever you realize there your animal is infected, you have to treat it, you have to quarantine that animal, uh, especially when you are uh, not vaccinated or not, uh, you, you are not uh, recovered from COVID. So there is a chance, but so far this has not been reported, especially what Dr. Hicks said, because it was first 
an event we call reverse zoonosis. The virus which came into humans from animals now goes back to animals, which is normal. There's always uh, back and forth. And this reverse zoonosis came from the owner. And so the owner most likely was already protected uh, uh, with uh, making uh, respected immune responses to the virus. Over. Dr. Hawkinson, yeah. uh, Ross wants to know, can ticks carry COVID? Um, yeah, at this point in time, there's no evidence that ticks can carry COVID. Again, we heard from our guests say um, that eating it uh, or eating deer that were infected with it probably is not going to transfer uh, SARS-CoV-2 to that person that's eating it. The same reason that ticks do not carry and have not been found to be a source of infection because there is a very short, if any, uh, viremic phage. So that means there's not a lot of virus in the blood at that time. So I think that's the short answer is there's no evidence that ticks or mosquitoes or anything like that, um, any other vectors of that nature carry the virus and can transmit the virus. I would like to say, I think a lot of people or virologists or scientists would say almost every virus that we know of that infects humans at one point or time has come from animals. We certainly know that's true with um, some of the regular cough and cold coronaviruses that we have that are circulating in the human population right now. And I'm glad you brought up mosquitoes. So Dr. Hicks, we oh, at Kansas go ahead. State have done several studies, Dr. Hicks and my group experimental infection of various mosquito species and experimental infection of midges. And there is no evidence that, not ticks, there's no evidence that mosquitoes or midges can amplify the virus. We have also done studies, and these are more interesting about mechanical transmission of COVID-19 by house flies. And we have shown that house flies can pick up when they feed some uh, on a, you know, on, on infected um, um, uh, saliva or whatever, that they can pick up the virus. And this virus stays vi viable, life for 24 hours, and they can carry it to another place. So we have to think when we think about mosquitoes and house flies, et cetera, we don't think about biological replication of the virus. But we have to keep in mind that there could be mechanical, meaning the, they pick up the virus on, on spot A and bring it to spot B, mechanical transmission of the virus. Over. And Jessica, you're going to ask a follow-up question about mosquitoes. I know you are. I um, was. I was. You know I was, because we were talking about that. And is that a large mosquito behind you, by the way? It is. It's um, a huge okay. plastic mosquito about three feet across um, that I use for teaching. It's it's a Texas hunting trophy. Um, I guess so. Right. <laughs> or Minnesota. Yeah. Well, it, it was nice. I knew by that big mosquito over your shoulder that that, that was like my visual cue to ask you about mosquitoes. So um, I know just elaborate a little bit on what Dr. Reich was talking about, just because you all have done extensive work uh, in the labs with mosquitoes. Tell us more. Right, so so that's my area of expertise. I've spent <laughs> since, since 1985 working on virus in, in mosquitoes, Jessica. So, um, you know, early on as SARS-CoV-2 was spreading, um, there was a question of, you know, could mosquitoes spread this virus? The WHO put out a sort of a blanket statement that it couldn't, but nobody had done any experiments. So what we did here, we, we reared various species of mosquito. Um, the ones that we focus on are the ones that primarily transmit viruses between animals and, and people. So one called Aedes aegypti, a yellow fever mosquito. Uh, one, the tiger mosquito, Aedes albopictus, and then a house mosquito, Culex pipiens, which, uh, or Concretaceatus, that spreads West Nile. So we had the three most important vectors of viruses here um, at the Biosecurity Research Institute at K-State. And so we decided that we, we had to, to test uh, to see if these mosquitoes were susceptible and if they could transmit. Um, you know, this virus has spread wildly, uh, rapidly and far by human to human contact. Um, imagine the scenario if mosquitoes could transmit it which you know bite almost indiscriminately all around the world um, it would make a bad situation even worse if that's imaginable 
So what we actually did was we um, we injected the virus uh, into mosquitoes. That is a sure test of um, sort of the worst case scenario of can these mosquitoes be infected? And we injected hundreds and hundreds of mosquitoes. Uh, we tested them for, for virus over the course of two weeks. So we did everything possible to make those, make the virus infect the mosquitoes or make the, the mosquitoes uh, infectable with the virus. And, um, you know, you always hope for positive results when you do experiments, but in this case, we really hope for negative results. And, uh, and we were delighted that uh, the virus couldn't infect the mosquitoes, the mosquitoes couldn't be infected. With, with the virus. And uh, we were actually the first group anywhere in the world to do these uh, laboratory-based experiments. Um, it's not, we published it in uh, Nature in Scientific Reports. It's been downloaded 4,000 times. Uh, case state, uh, communications and marketing with Erin uh, Pennington and so forth, wrote up a story. Um, it, it appeared within a couple of weeks in 600 news outlets in 42 countries and was translated into uh, 18 different languages. So it was, you know, an, an incredible spotlight on, on the sort of work that we can do here and very reassuring. So that, that's been a fun part of the COVID for me. If, if well, we, we are not, a, Dr. Higgs, we're not at all surprised um, with the, all the work that you and your teams are doing. I mean, it's fantastic work and we're glad your findings came up negative. So that's a relief, that's for sure. And yeah. we look forward to hearing more about what you all are studying. So keep all that information coming and, and congrats on all of that exposure and and uh, getting all of your word and your work out there. Um, speaking of mosquitoes slash birds, I guess, I don't know if this is a, tri if this is a, a good leap, but somebody was wondering if there's been any research in birds. Dr. Rick, anything you can add to that? Yes, in uh, okay. some bird species, um, chickens, turkeys, I think in another species, maybe quail, but uh, they are resistant to SARS-CoV-2, experimental to experimental infection with the ancestral strains of SARS-CoV-2. So Deb was asking about like how, like her pet bird. Are these things that people should be worried about? I think you know this conversation just brings up people around their pets. They're very close to their pets. They're in their face. They're licking them. They're biting them. Um, how concerned should people be about their house animals, their beloved pets? Um, as you know, we just talked about the avian species, and it looks like from in silico data they are resistant, and also experimental data. We have obviously various pet animals which are susceptible. I already mentioned companion animals, uh, dogs, cats. Dogs are not so susceptible. Cats are more susceptible. Then we have ferrets, which are highly susceptible. We have hamsters, highly susceptible. And we now have a new, a lot of people have a rodent species at home. The ancestral strains of SARS-CoV-2, the wild type mouse, uh, Mus musculus, uh, Okay. Um, the white time mouse was resistant, but these new variants of concern strains, especially the alpha, beta, and gamma, which have a very specific mutation in the receptor binding domain, they are able to infect non-transgenic wild type mice. And so this is obviously a big concern of people like me who are working in this um, realm of um, zoonotic uh, transmission of um, viruses from animals to humans. And now we have a new animal species, which is actually huge and it's everywhere. Mice and rats are uh, susceptible um, with the uh, new strains of SARS-CoV-2. Over. So Jürgen, how are deer, how are wild deer getting infected? It's not like hunters are sneaking out there um, infected and sneaking up on deer and breathing on them. Um, and we know that mosquitoes and ticks aren't, aren't infected. So how are the wild deer getting infected? So this is a question I, you have to ask the authors of the paper, uh, which was published a month ago. I cannot answer this question, but what we are, which we, what we published a year ago with my colleague, uh, Dr. McNamara and others, we already said, we have to be careful that we establish 
a secondary reservoir for SARS-CoV-2 in animals. And I'm saying that for the last one and a half years. And my biggest concern in the beginning were feral cats. We have 60 to 100 million feral cats in this country, and they are fed every day by um, uh, people who might have COVID and transmit it in their colonies. And then these feral cats go out and mingle with wildlife. They mingle with uh, mussolite species. They're highly susceptible. Otters, mink, maybe also martens, etc., are susceptible. They mingle with mice, you know, in their environment are mice and other rodents, deer mice. And that's the way, most likely, they get in contact with wild deer. So I do not know the exact way this happens. But this is a scenario uh, which we are discussing for more than a year now, that uh, a secondary reservoir of SARS-CoV-2 can be established in wild animals. And that's why research and resources have to be um, made available to do biosurveillance in these animal populations. Oh, well. Are you interested? Thanks. Yeah, I mean, I, I think those are good points. And I would just say that um, I would be more concerned about your, your dog licking your face if you ever know where a dog eats and licks in general. So I think you need to be careful in that way. But I think um, his, his point originally about the mouse and the ancestral variant or the ancestral strain of of SARS-CoV-2 was unable to infect mice. But just as he said now, as you have more passages, either in the human population or animal populations, it can now infect mice. So I think that is one point uh, one very good data point that some people will point to that this is not from a lab leak or a specific engineered virus because virology labs, virus experiments, a lot are done in mice populations. So the fact that th that original uh, Wuhan ancestral strain could not infect mice is one point that uh, helps contradict the point that it was a lab leak or an, uh, uh, an engineered virus as well. I have a so couple I have more to questions. Add, the Go original for it. strain could not infect non transgenic mice, not gene manipulated mice. There was a mouse model which was gene edited, which the ancestral strain could infect. But a wild type non transgenic mice, it was not able to infect. And Dr. Hawkins was correct. This is a sign that this virus was not passaged in any rodent species, etc. Thank you. Dr. Rick, I have one uh, last viewer question for you. Uh, it comes from Lori. She says, I volunteer with a therapy group that has dogs and cats and horses that go to hospitals and nursing homes for pet therapy. Uh, all human partners are vaccinated for, uh, for COVID. Should we be concerned about our therapy animals and them being around people they don't know, maybe people who aren't vaccinated? What kind of precautions should they be taking, if any? So that's a tough one, but as I said, uh, an, a human being who is shedding SARS-CoV-2 can infect cats, also dogs. So there is a potential that these animals get infected in being in contact with SARS-CoV-2 patients. So uh, I would say it depends how close you get, uh, you, 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 you wear obviously the person they interact with has to wear a mask, hopefully is vaccinated, et cetera, et cetera. So um, you, you have to keep the same um, uh, precautions in place like you have if you are naive and interacting with an infected, potentially infected patient or potentially infected uh, visitor. So the same thing would apply for your pet animals, which are susceptible to SARS-CoV-2 you bring out into uh, hospitals, et cetera. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Dr. Hawkins, and a couple questions yeah. for you really quick. Heather wants to know, just found out my young kids were outside playing and riding bikes with our neighbor kids for about five minutes. They tested positive, should she be worried? You know, I wouldn't be too worried about this. Again, they are outside. They're probably going to be, you know, at least some distance apart. Um, it is turbulent, good airflow and ventilation. I wouldn't be too concerned. Just go ahead and watch them for the next few days. And if again, at this point, if any symptoms develop, go ahead and take them in uh, to get tested.
Ted, last questions from Janet. As a transplant patient, it is very discouraging to hear of the fully vaccinated immunocompromised patients hospitalized with COVID. My question is, do most of these patients end up in ICU on a ventilator? I think that just varies. and I don't think there's any way to really predict that. Certainly, uh, we know that the more immune suppressed you are, the less likely you'll have a robust immune response, but it really does kind of boil down to that individual. And hopefully now with the additional or third dosing of the vaccine, that will give more protection to those immunosuppressed patients. Dr. Rick, I do have one more question for you because it just popped up on my feed. So I do want to ask you, but Catherine says that she just heard from um, that at the Kansas City Zoo that they're going to be vaccinating cats and primates. She wants to know how will that vaccine differ from a human vaccine if an animal vaccine is on the horizon? Will it look the same? Will it look different? Will it be stronger? Do we know? Um, it's very similar to some of, it's, I cannot say details uh, because I know a little more about it, but I cannot uh, provide details right now, but it's very similar to the human vaccines. Um, and and um, it, is, uh, it is given in two shots. And so I, it worked very well in the animal models the company tested with, with you know, vaccination and then a challenge efficacy studies. So it should be, uh, as good as the human vaccines are, the human vaccines are wonderful. They have incredible efficacy uh, rates and uh, actually also an incredible safety profile. So I would uh, hope that the animal vaccine is similar, but it's not tested in thousands and thousands of animals like the human vaccines are. When you can share those secret mm -hmm. details, will you promise to come back on our show? <laughs> I. If I, if, if the, yes, if I'm allowed to share the uh, confidential data, I will be able to come back, certainly. But again, vaccines are great, are highly efficacious, uh, not only in humans, but also in animals, and they are safe. And that's one of the best uh, ways to protect yourself against, as Dr. Hawkins says, not against, not only against the ancestral strains of SARS-CoV-2, but also of the presently circulating and future strains of SARS-CoV-2, which will be coming up. There is no question. It's only when they, they will come up. The only question is when. Thank you so much for both of you joining us today. Uh, we're going to wrap up, but I want to get some final thoughts from both of our joining guests. Dr. Rick, I'll go ahead and let you start. Uh, just what are your final thoughts? What do you want us to know? As I just said, I think the best way to protect yourself is using a safe and efficacious vaccine. I think using instead using a drug which has no re clearly shown efficacy in COVID-19 patients and on top could be poisonous, toxic to you, doesn't make any sense. So my advice is and all my people here in my group and my uh, uh, relatives, my household, they're all vaccinated. And um, and if there is a, a, a booster vaccine necessary in the next couple of months, we will do that too. So for me, my real uh, hope is that people really use safe ways to get protected against uh, this uh, pandemic virus. Over. Dr. Higgs, thanks for being with us today. What is your final thoughts for us? Well, I, I want to thank you for, for letting us talk today. Um, we've talked about some of the COVID research that we're doing. Um, there's other research on, on SARS-CoV-2, for example. You know, there were on over 330,000 meat packaging uh, employees infected with this virus when it was um, uh, first spreading. Uh, we actually have uh, Randy Phoebus from Animal Science and uh, Sally Davis from, from the College of Med doing studies on a simulated meat processing package here at the BRI. And then we're working on a whole bunch of other things. You may have heard of African swine fever that is in the Dominican Republic now, which is a, an incredible potential threat to our agricultural system. And we're actively doing research on that since about 2013. So lots going on here, Jessica. Come back to us sometime and we'll uh, tell you even more good things. Oh, we're definitely putting you back on the list. Thank you so much for being with us. This has been a really interesting conversation and we've learned a lot. So thank you both, um, Dr. Hawkinson, your final thought today. 
Yeah, I just want to thank our guests. It's been really insightful. We know how important uh, animals and pets are to our families. Uh, this is good information about the virus as well and kind of what is going on in the animal world. So I really want to um, wholeheartedly thank our guests and would love to have you back on. Again, continue to get vaccinated. Uh, we know, as we have said, that the vaccines still offer great protection against the variants. Uh, we know that school is ongoing now in an effort to protect you and your family, keep your kids in school, keep your kids doing extracurricular things and not losing participation days. If they're 12 and over, please go get vaccinated. All right, so Dr. Hawkins, you know I've been, you know how we love our memes around here and they yeah. just kind of make us laugh and giggle. Yes. Just the, it just eases the tension a little bit on these <laughs> rough, hard days sometimes. And I know it's the way, same way for all of our viewers and all the things they do all day long. So anyway, this one, we've got a good one tomorrow for Dr. Seitz, but this one was sent in by you. Um, and I just wanted you to kind of explain as if it's not self-explanatory, but um, it's just one of those things that kind of hits home, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah, I mean, I got this from another uh, colleague as well. So I think it, it is just um, this gentleman who's kind of going along and talking about who's vaccinated. Um, we know, uh, despite, you know, President Trump's um, um, some of his words against the virus, uh, he did get vaccinated and it shows other people who did get vaccinated. But I think more importantly, down at the bottom, it shows who, who didn't get vaccinated. And that is the vast majority of those people that are hospitalized uh, with COVID-19 right now. And I know that's just a meme or, or a, a tweet, but that is really well supported by all of the uh, peer reviewed evidence uh, from around the world showing that the people that are hospitalized and are dying, the vast, vast majority of them are unvaccinated. So just one more little a meme to help push somebody to get vaccinated. I love it. Thanks so much for sending that to me. Okay, so, and thank you all for being with us today and all your great questions. The ones we didn't get to, we'll get to on Friday as always. And tomorrow, yes, he is back. Open mics with Dr. Stites. He'll be sitting right here. And uh, we're going to be talking about dropping your kids off. We know people get worried about dropping their kids off at school. They've been doing this um, for the last couple of weeks now. Dr. Stites is going to be joined by pediatrician Dr. Brad Nelson on the long term impact of COVID. If there is any, what that's going to look like. Um, not to be scary, but we want to kind of explore what's going on with the kiddos. So we're going to talk about that tomorrow starting at 8. So make it a great day. We'll see you then. Subscribe to our morning medical update and open mics with Dr. Stites podcasts. Now everywhere podcasts are available.